Good afternoon and welcome to our esteemed panelists and our guests. Today, we're gonna have a wonderful conversation about what about us? COVID in women, children and youth. As we know, the landscape has been vastly changing and rapidly changing from week to week and day to day on how we should be addressing COVID for our personal lives as well as for our careers. So this afternoon, we're going to be engaging in a helpful conversation to learn more about the state of COVID as it is today, um, vac vaccinations, uh, how to handle it with our children and our families, and uh, some other facts around nutrition. So today's moderators are Ms. Tamaya Nolan. She is a nurse scientist at The Ohio State University College of Nursing and Comprehensive Cancer Center. She also serves as the co-chair of Alpha Sigma Omega Chapters Women's Health Committee. Our second esteemed moderator is Dr. Dina Chisholm, a professor in the Division of Health Services Management and Policy. She's also the principal investigator for the Center of Innovation and Pediatric Practice at the Research Institute at Nationwide Children's Hospital. She's a professor of pediatrics at The Ohio State College of Medicine, and she is also a former president and member of Alpha Sigma Omega chapter. And with that, thank you and welcome. Tamaya. Thank you all so much for being here. We have a wonderful panel of, of, of just wonderful women, wonderful women of color too, to help us talk about COVID in women, children, and youth. And I would like to take this uh, time to actually introduce you to these lovely women. And so we have Dr. Jordy Wells, and she is an attending physician in the Division of Emergency Medicine at Nationwide Children's Hospital and an assistant professor of pediatrics at The Ohio State University College of Medicine. Dr. Wells received her Doctor of Medicine from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine and her Master of Public Health from the Ohio State University College of Public Health. In the Division of Emergency Medicine, she serves as the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and as a Principal Investigator in the Center for Child Health Equity and Outcomes Research at the Ab Abigail Wexner Research Institute at Nationwide Children's. Her research interests include health policy, social determinants of health, population health, and reducing health disparities in pediatric emergency care. Next, we have Dr. Reversa Joseph, and she's a board certified neurologist specializing in movement disorders and intraoperative monitoring. Dr. Joseph's focus is treating patients with Parkinson's disease using a comprehensive and integrated approach. Dr. Joseph received her Bachelor's of Arts at Columbia University, her medical degree at Georgetown University, and completed her neurology residency training at Yale University and pursued fellowship training at Georgetown University and the National Institutes of Health. She serves as the director of the Movement Disorders Clinic at at Chalmers Wiley VA and as an assistant, um, excuse me, adjunct assistant professor of neurology at The Ohio State University's Wexner Medical Center. And her current research interests uh, include mindfulness-based training for improvement of gait and Parkinson's disease and developing an integrative approach in the treatment of neurodegenerative disorders. Next, we have Dr. Sashin Garrison, and she was raised in Huntington, West Virginia, and she received a Bachelor's of Arts degree in chemistry from Denison U University. She received her Doctor of, Doctor of Dental Surgery degree uh, from The Ohio State University's College of Dentistry. And in dental school, she enjoyed focusing on preventive oral uh, care and working with children. Uh, she did her externship at the Navajo Indian Reservation at Gallup, uh, New Mexico, acquiring more knowledge in areas such as oral surgery and pediatric dentistry. And she has also part participated in dental mission trips to Mexico, where she has provided dental treatment in underserved communities. Now, Dr. Garrison has worked in dental practices in Columbus and Lancaster, Ohio, providing uh, varied services around handling minor to complex dental cases. Dr. Garrison is the president of the Columbus Association of Dentists, which is the local chapter of the National Dental Association, and she currently owns and operates a private practice in Groveport, Ohio. Dr. Garrison is committed to incorporating new advancements in dental technologies into her practice and enhancing her patients' experiences, as well as providing a comfortable and caring environment for her patients. 
And then last but not least, we have Dr. Olivia Nathan, and she is a native of Columbus, Ohio. She completed her undergraduate study, studies at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, and she graduated with a bachelor's of science there. She earned her doctorate of pharmacy at the University of California, San Francisco, where she gained extensive training in San Francisco Bay Area, working with HIV and AIDS communities. Dr. Nathan is a board certified uh, specialist in HIV from the Academy, uh, American Academy of HIV Medicine. And currently, uh, Dr. Nathan is in the, serving the community as a community engagement pharmacist for Equitas Health in the King Lincoln District of Columbus, Ohio. And at Equitas, she aligns herself with a mission to really do good uh, and, and really affect the health of those affected by HIV for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer questioning community, and for those seeking a welcoming health uh, healthcare home. Dr. Nathan is sincere in delivering culturally competent care to patients in the underserved communities, advocating for health equity, and creating conditions that improve health and address the social determinants of health. And she's a proud mem member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Thank you so much. And I want to just welcome you in your own way to tell us just a few minutes about what's going on. What are you seeing in your, ne your neck of the woods? Let's start with Dr. Wells. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and for allowing me to be here to participate in this really important conversation. I will say that in the pediatric emergency department, this year is nothing like last year. Uh, last year, we really had very few cases of children coming to the emergency department really to seek care regarding COVID-19 and really for any respiratory virus. Um, it was really a, a season that we as uh, providers were not used to seeing. However, this year we are seeing a lot more children that have COVID-19, those that are requiring hospitalizations, those that are requiring intensive care. And we really are seeing some of those complications of COVID-19 that were described in adults. We see them in children as well, including those needing um, uh, therapy for blood clots and, and, and things that are really severe conditions. On top of the number of children that we're seeing for COVID-19, we are also seeing a ton of children for another respiratory virus that commonly affects kids, and that's RSV. RSV is typically a virus that we see in the wintertime, so I expect to see a lot of cases between November and February, but we have seen an immense amount of cases of RSV starting this summer and all through the fall that are really affecting our kids that are under two especially. And so we are getting a lot more hospitalizations for those children as well. So we're really fighting two different viruses that are really increasing our volumes in the pediatric ER, so much so that when we talk to community hospitals that may be 45 minutes to an hour or two hours away from our hospital, they usually are calling on us and rely on us to give specialized care for pediatric patients. And we are at times having to not be able to accept those critically ill children because our house is too full. And so what we're having to do is to try to help them navigate their systems at home or also potentially finding other places of care, which for me as a pediatric provider is not what we want to do. We want to be able to, to open our doors all the time for any child that's critically ill. Thank you so much, Dr. Wells. Now we'll hear from Dr. Joseph. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you again for the invitation to be on this panel uh, this afternoon. Uh, for me, I would say that, you know, over this past year and a half uh, since coronavirus, uh, the pandemic has struck the U.S., um, I think we've had a year and a half of kind of hunkering down, zooming in, teleworking. And I think if we look back to last October, we knew it would be difficult, but I don't think that we knew how difficult. And certainly we didn't really think that we would still be in the fix of it, you know, uh, the challenge of COVID-19 lasting this long. But I think that it's been a challenge on multiple fronts. And for many people, the challenge has been overwhelming and affecting the mental health. And I think that's what I've been seeing mostly, patients coming in kind of reporting um, mental health issues, specific negative impacts of mental health, such as you know difficulty sleeping, eating, 
um, you know, more depressive symptoms, more anxiety, uh, increase in alcohol consumption and substance use disorders, uh, and just worsening of chronic conditions uh, due to worry and stress over the coronavirus. And, you know, we've seen that the coronavirus uh, pandemic has affected African Americans disproportionately. And the one thing we know is that African Americans are kind of the least to really go out to seek help for mental health issues. So that's something I really want to raise awareness about, because specifically with, with women, we are seeing that about 40% of women have reported symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder compared to men. Uh, and we know that women has really faced a lot of the brunt of this uh, pandemic with you know, children being at home, having to take care of children. Um, so that, that's an issue too. And when I, my patients, you know, when I ask, you know, well, what are you telling, you know, are you reaching out to others, you know, to, to, to let them know, you know, how you're feeling. And what we see is that, you know, when others try to connect, we sometimes, you know, only give the best version of ourselves to others, even to people that we love. We often don't really show them our vulnerability or how we're really struggling, but it, it is important to kind of express that side of ourselves. Maybe the other person that's trying to connect with you by text or phone call is struggling too. And so they, they, they may want to hear that, that you are struggling. So it's important to really share our feelings and our true feelings when we connect with our families uh, to help kind of increase that emotional int intimacy of our relationships because of all of the Zooming and, you know, that kind of lack of, uh, of, of the social isolation that we've been in. So really only highlighting the positive highlights of our lives doesn't really give a good depiction of that. So just wanna encourage, as I encourage my patients, be honest about your feelings with your loved ones, be honest even with your physician about how you're feeling, reach out if you need help. Uh, so I just wanna encourage that to everyone on the, on, the, on the call today, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. And now we'll move to Dr. Nathan. What are you seeing in your community? Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to share with this dynamic panel today. Um, so from my perspective as a community pharmacist um, who's serving the HIV and AIDS population in Franklin County, initially when COVID-19 hit the community, it really mirrored the HIV epidemic that happened um, in the 1980s. And so there was a lot of fear, there was a lot of anxiety. And so from my perspective, it was very important to push the medical miracle that we have in the vaccinations to keep our community safe and healthy. Um, this pandemic has had a lot of different seasons, but right now I think what resonates with me the most is that we're really currently in the pandemic of the unvaccinated. And so when the vaccines came to the community, um, I saw a huge disparity. Um, there was a disproportionate amount of folks from the black community who went unvaccinated. Um, and even at Equitas Health, we had folks coming from the suburbs to the inner city to get vaccinations. And so that really um, was a call to action for me to really push to um, have these pop-up vaccination clinics in underserved communities to partner with communities where we trust. So whether that's the Black church, whether that's um, the Urban League, whether that's Ohio State, to really find voices that, that Black folks trust to make sure that we can increase the vaccination uptake. And so I think right now we're still in the pandemic of the unvaccinated for sure. And so um, calls like this to increase the awareness of the safety and efficacy of the vaccine is really important. Thank you so much, Dr. Nathan. I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I know that we'll uh, talk a lot more about that as we move forward. I um, also want to hear from our dentists of the group. Dr. Gar Garrison, what are you seeing? Hello, thank you everybody for inviting me and allowing me to share. Um, unlike our other panelists, I am not in a hospital or clinic-like setting. I am in a completely private practice, totally different setting. And the other thing I am other than a dentist is a small business owner. So when COVID first hit, uh, a lot of small business owners, whatever um, discipline they were in, whether that was a restaurant owner or bar owner, were hit very hard uh, financially. You know, having to shut down for eight weeks was was very difficult. But one thing we have seen since we reopened in May of 2020 is an uptick in business, which has really been surprising. Um, we have been so busy. And part of that is because we have had to space out people and go at a slower pace. In the dental industry, we've also lost a lot of 
um, healthcare workers, a lot of dental hygienists. Um, there was a study done by the American Dental Association that came out that um, rated dentists and dental hygienists as one of the, the um, most dangerous professions as far as COVID is concerned. And that is true because one of the things they tell you with COVID is you should be six feet apart. You should, both people should have on a mask. Well, in order for my job to work, somebody has to have their mask off and you can't be <laughs> further than six feet apart. So those two things um, has, has been challenging for us. So um, we've had a lot of cancellations recently in our schedule um, as far as kids who had symptoms or been sick with COVID. So we've definitely seen that. A lot of people will come in who have had COVID and they're concerned about, they had loss of taste and smell. So that's something I've been documenting is my patients that come in and say, hey, I lost my taste or smell, but I had COVID eight months ago and I still can't taste or smell right. Or what I do taste, um, they're reporting it tastes like chemicals or rotten meat or different things like that. And they want to know, well, when, when is my smell going to come back? When is my taste going to smell back? I mean, my taste going to come back and I'm not really sure, uh, you know, the answer to that. And that's kind of a great unknown. People will come in and say, I've got an infection, something's wrong with my mouth, x-ray on my teeth. And, and, you know, we're looking like, no, that that's not the cause. So there's a lot of things we still don't know about uh, COVID-19 uh, that hopefully, you know, with more research and more data tracking, we will be able to, to be able to tell in the future. Thank you so much for that uh, information. And thank you to all of our panelists. As you can hear here, we do have a wealth of knowledge from uh, a number of different backgrounds to really give us some uh, insight today on what COVID means for women, children, and youth. Um, but one of the reasons why uh, the Alpha Sigma Omega chapter wanted to come together and bring you this information was because we knew that, you know, there were so many things that were, uh, uh, that were changing. And I had a, a situation just a few um, just a few weeks ago with my daughter being in daycare and so I so happened to be picking her up with um, with a, a, another group of, of parents and so we had a call that said hey somebody in another class has COVID um, and so every we we're going to close the school for a whole week uh, and um, we're just going to be um, uh, updating or up upgrading our precautions and um, we'll let you know things as we hear from the health department. And I can tell you that that was one of the most frightening um, calls and texts that I did receive because I was wondering about my baby who is just now um, 13 months old and she's not uh, eligible to get a vaccine. Uh, I am vaccinated myself and I am still breastfeeding her. And so I'm doing you know, what I can, but I can't protect her from the world and I can't protect her from the environment. And she uh, is not, uh, uh, you know, does not have the wherewithal to keep a mask on. And so, you know, we're here today to talk to other moms, other grandmas, other members of the family, and here to really get some information so that we can dispel myths. And so with that, I want to encourage you all to use the chat feature to drop in your questions. I do have a list of questions here. And so um, towards the end, uh, if we do have extra time, I will circle back around uh, to answer those questions. So please do feel free to use the chat feature. Now, our first question. Now we've learned about the challenges that each of you are seeing across your disciplines. And for those in the audience who may not be aware, Dr. Garrison, can you speak to the signs and the symptoms of COVID? Um, yes. Um, one of the main uh, signs when COVID first um, became aware to all of us was fever. Now, I feel that that has kind of changed because I know a lot of people who've had COVID who did not have a fever at all. In our office, we track everybody before they walk in the front door by taking their temperature. And over an entire year, I haven't had one person that had a fever. However, I have been tested for COVID myself before I got vaccinated over 13 times because I would literally work on somebody on a Monday. They call me up two or three days later with symptoms. They go get tested. They're positive for COVID. I have to shut down, go get tested. So, you know, that, that's that been a big headache <laughs> and, and a stressor, you know, these these last few months. Um, so fever is still definitely a sign, but I just want everybody to be aware, you know, just because you may have cold symptoms, you don't have a fever, don't think that you don't have COVID. Um, the other one that everybody knows is a dry cough. 
tiredness, um, aches and pains, body aches, uh, sore throat, diarrhea, headache is another one. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I think I just have a sinus infection because I just have a headache and nasal congestion. Um, obviously loss of taste and smell. The interesting thing about loss of taste and smell is it seems like, and some of the other panelists can probably speak on this better than I can, that with the Delta variant, we're seeing less of the loss of taste and smell. It doesn't seem to be presenting as often or as much as it originally did. Um, also skin rash, you can um, get a rash. Uh, that's a, a smaller symptom of it. Obviously the serious uh, symptoms of COVID are difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, chest pain or pressure, um, any of those, um, you know, you're definitely getting into the more serious um, side effects. So th with the Delta variant, it has more cold-like symptoms, meaning runny nose, fever, headache, uh, sore throat, things like that, less, less um, loss of taste and smell, side effects, not to say that you still can't get it. Uh, it is also more highly contagious than the original variant. Um, as these viruses mutate, they get smarter and you know they wanna survive, you know, and they're gonna find a way to survive however they can. And that's that's what's happening. Um, it also appears to be growing more rap rapidly in the respiratory tracts. And um, as a dentist, that's one thing that we're obviously concerned about, you know, when we when we're running the drill or anything like that, that involves aerosol generation, which, um, and we're right there in their faces. So it's, it's a very um, concerning <laughs> that the Delta variant has changed so much. And um, if anybody else wants to add anything else for signs and symptoms of COVID, or if you wanna speak and elaborate to what I've already mentioned, please go ahead. I think all of the signs and symptoms that you said, you know, are, are very accurate. Um, the only thing I would just comment on is that we've also seen cases of patients being asymptomatic. And so that has also been a, a source of spread of the COVID-19 is because people don't know that they have it and then they're spreading it around, uh, you know, because of lack of wearing masks and these things. And what we're seeing with the Delta variants, you know, even though you know, we're seeing breakthrough cases, some breakthrough cases of uh, people that have been vaccinated, uh, but then they have a breakthrough uh, infection with the COVID-19 and they can be asymptomatic as well and spread it or have mild symptoms. So now we're not seeing the patients that have been vaccinated that, you know, maybe get catch the breakthrough infection with Delta, have very severe illness and then hospitalized or deaths in those patients, not like the unvaccinated patients, but there has been some breakthrough cases. So, you know, the recommendation just, even though you're vaccinated, continue to wear the mask. Absolutely. And I thank you both for, for those very um, wonderful answers. And both of you have alluded to variants. And so Dr. Wells, I wonder, can you speak about the new variants uh, of COVID and what you're seeing, especially how they're affecting children? Absolutely. Um, the first thing I want to say about variants are that variants are expected we know that this is gonna happen. As viruses are constantly mutating and taking new forms, as was alluded earlier. And so we know that that goes on and that's why they're, all of the variants that have been identified are constantly tracked here in our country. But the one that's getting the most buzz right now is the Delta variant. And the Delta variant um, is important because it arrived and it has persisted and it has now become the most common type of COVID-19 infection. And so one thing that we know about the Delta variant is that it's a lot easier to spread from person to person. And so that's one big way that it is actually affecting our children. Because as opposed to last year, this year, a lot more kids are in in-person school. We were doing a lot of distance lear learning previously. And also there's been a lot of differing policies related to masking in schools. And so because of that, we, have the opportunity for children to spread. Now we only require masking for children ages two and older. Um, and so if children are not necessarily going to be able to 
one, keep their mask on, or if we have varying uh, policies about when they should mask, we definitely are going to have more opportunities for kids to catch the infection and spread the infection. And I think this is um, a big reason that ease, that ease of transmission of the Delta variant that we're seeing a lot more children that are presenting with uh, COVID-19. And when you say presenting with COVID-19, are they presenting with the same symptoms? Children are presenting um, with the same symptoms. The one thing that the most common things we are seeing for children are fever, cough, um, they're having runny nose, everything that you would think about for your typical cold we're seeing, also headache and body aches um, for children, but some are also not having any symptoms at all um, that are having COVID-19. So we definitely are seeing the full spectrum in our older children, our preteens and adolescents, some of them can talk about whether or not they're having any uh, changes in their senses of taste and smell. And so all of those symptoms are still common there. But I will say that on any given shift in the pediatric ER, about 90% of my patients are gonna have a fever. It's just common to have respiratory viruses in children. And so there's no way to distinguish, is this COVID-19? Is it that RSV virus or something else? So um, you can't really tell just what, it, what um, the virus is going on. So it's really important that if you're having any symptoms, whether it's you or your child to get tested so that you know whether or not um, COVID-19 is, is uh, causing your symptoms. Thank you so much for that answer. And so, you know, a large population of our, um, of our, excuse me, a large portion of our population has actually been diagnosed uh, with COVID. And so what we're, one of our challenges that we're seeing now is that, you know, really children and, and adults, there's this long COVID or exacerbated symptoms that can remain after the diagnosis. So Dr. Joseph, what are some of the things that our listeners should be aware of following a positive COVID test? Oh, well, thank you for that question. So most people with COVID-19 do recover uh, completely within a few weeks, but we are seeing some that are experiencing kind of lingering, prolonged symptoms. Uh, and these individuals may use, we may use the term of long uh, COVID long haulers or having COVID long, long-term COVID symptoms. Uh, syndrome or long COVID. Uh, and in these patients, there's no longer the coronavirus kind of infection running around. So if they were tested, they would be test negative for the coronavirus, but they still might have very severely debilitating uh, symptoms. And it what's clear that there are certain risk factors that, you know, a person that may lead a person to have an increased risk of developing just COVID-19 in general, like high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, obesity, and um, other conditions. But um, they're really, th th those conditions don't necessarily correlate with developing the long uh, COVID symptoms. So you could have a positive test result for COVID-19, be asymptomatic, have no symptoms of the COVID, but then weeks later actually develop some of these long uh, COVID symptoms. And what, what are they? So the CDC kind of um, lists those symptoms as having a long lasting fatigue, shortness of breath, cough, joint pain, chest pain, uh, difficulty concentrating, depression, muscle pain, headache, uh, rapid heartbeat, and having this kind of intermittent fever. Uh, and this is because, you know, COVID-19 affects literally every organ in, in the body. So it can affect your brain, can affect your lungs, can affect your heart, your liver, your kidneys, uh, even your blood vessels. So it can lead to inflammation of the blood vessels. Okay, that can lead to having what we call like a vasculitis or, uh, or even strokes can lead to strokes. Uh, and so COVID effects in the lungs is causing people to have this shortness of breath, even just doing minimal tasks, having shortness of breath. And you can see how debilitating that could be. Uh, heart problems, uh, having inflammation of the heart that can uh, affect also uh, your breathing, causing these rapid uh, heartbeats as well. Uh, can cause kidney damage that you may need long-term dialysis if you have, you know, really severe kidney damage. Um, also, the loss of sense of taste and smell that uh, Dr. Uh, Garrison had re reported before uh, as, a, as a symptom we can see of, of COVID-19. This can be a long-lasting symptom that doesn't really resolve within a few weeks and can be lasting for months. And although that might not seem life-threatening, uh, it can affect your appetite and having, you know, poor appetite because you can't taste or smell 
over time makes people, you know, depressed because they, they really can't eat because they don't, you know, have a good appetite. So that, that, that can be debilitating. Uh, some of the neurologic complications that we're seeing is this kind of brain fog people are describing with having difficulty concentrating, um, you know, they're, they're just not being able to really follow along in conversations. And you can imagine how that could be debilitating at work if you're not able to concentrate, to think, and your brain just be, seems fogged up. So we're seeing that. Uh, some other symptoms as well, we talked about the mental health that I alluded to earlier. So we're seeing depression and anxiety that's being long lasting headaches as well. Uh, and then the, the other thing, diabetes, we're seeing that that is a risk factor, but we're seeing some people actually develop some signs and symptoms of the diabetes after they uh, have had uh, COVID. And we're seeing these long hauler symptoms also in children and teens. So it's not just adults that can develop these long haul COVID symptoms. So that, that's important to note. And that in children, they can be similar symptoms uh, what, in terms of you know, the fatigue, uh, the headaches, uh, difficulty concentrating in children that were normal before they had COVID. Uh, and the other thing to just look out for is the heart inflammation in athletes that, they, that can develop uh, you know, after having infection with COVID-19. So it's important that the, the, if you're having a child that's playing, you know, sports, especially the males playing sports, that they get checked out to make sure that everything is okay and that there's no inflammation before um, moving on to sports. Uh, and lastly, I think one thing in terms of how long these long-term symptoms last, we really don't know. So uh, this is something we're still studying to see how long these long-term COVID symptoms last. We treat them just by treating the symptoms that patients present with. But one um, kind of positive thing is that, you know, we've heard an anecdotal things that people say that they've had these long COVID symptoms, they got the vaccine and they started to feel better. So we have to really study that, but that is an encouraging thing that, you know, maybe by getting the vaccine that that might help, but just another push for getting the vaccine in general is that you don't want to get this long-term COVID. You don't want to have those long-term symptoms. So it's not just okay to say, oh, I had a mild infection or I was asymptomatic. Even the asymptomatic people can develop long COVID symptoms and we don't know who that will be. So get the vaccine. That's kind of your best chance to try to prevent getting COVID in the first place. Thank you so much for that. And you know, that's a perfect segue because the next question and actually some of the, one of the questions that we saw in the chat was about the vaccine. So we know that we have some powerful tools to reduce our chances of getting a COVID-19 um, uh, COVID uh, and, and that will help hopefully not, you know, if we get COVID-19, it's not going to send us to the hospital uh, and we're not going to be facing a loved one or ourselves, um, you know, um, dying of, of COVID. And so Dr. Nathan, uh, our, our pharmacist on on our panel. Can you tell us about the available vaccines and what you know about how these vaccines work against the different variants of COVID-19? Yes, so that's such a great question and such a robust question at this stage of the pandemic. Um, what I will say is that it's very important to not utilize Instagram and TikTok and other social media outlets as your basis of information when it comes to the vaccine. There is so much misinformation out there. Um, but one thing I do want to uplift today from my perspective, and I'm sure a lot of the other panelists share the same sentiment, is that COVID-19 vaccinations are effective against the severe disease and death from variants that cause COVID-19 that is currently circulating in the United States in Franklin County, um, and that includes the Delta variant. So I want to say that again, because it's so very important that we understand that these vaccinations are safe against severe disease and death from the variants that are currently circulating in our, in our communities. There are two types of vaccinations. Um, so there's the mRNA-based vaccination, so that's the Pfizer and Moderna. And really, those vaccinations work by just giving our instructions, um, cells to our, instructions to our cells to make a harmless piece of what's called a spike protein. And that spike protein is what we saw on the surface of the virus that causes COVID-19. When it comes to the Johnson & Johnson or the viral vector vaccine, it's literally just a modified version of a different virus or the vector that delivers instructions to our cells. And so the nuances of how the vaccinations work can be very hard to understand. 
Um, but I do want to assure you that they're safe. And I want to encourage you to ask myself or a healthcare provider that you trust questions if questions remain about how the vaccines work. Um, but the end game is really just if your body sees COVID, it'll fight it off, you will build antibodies, and it won't cause the COVID that um, we're seeing patients hospitalized with, and then unfortunately, in some cases, death. So as time progresses, we are seeing a lot of new data. And what we're seeing is that the mRNA vaccines, whether that's Pfizer or Moderna, um, it does cover against the variants that, we're, that we see now. And from my perspective, really the variants that are sure to come if we don't roll up our sleeves and continue to get vaccinated. Um, the data is still emerging when it comes to booster doses um, with the Johnson & Johnson. Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. So in full transparency, there is no current recommendation right now for an extra dose um, of the vaccination for people who got the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine, even if they have a qualifying medical condition. And while there's information that is not yet available, um, there is some preliminary data that boosters will be coming for Johnson & Johnson. And the data that we have right now suggests that these um, vaccination booster doses will increase um, the protection, similarly to the boosters that we'll see with the mRNA vaccinations, which is really impressive. So I do want to pause really quickly and talk about the nuances of the need of a third dose and a booster dose. So if you are in a category of people who did not respond adequately to the first two doses of the vaccine, so that's a lot of immunocompromised folks, people are, who are on immunosuppressive therapy, then over time, um, your immunity can wane or what will happen is you didn't get enough protection from your first dose. And so you would then need a third dose. When we talk about booster doses, however, um, that's recommended because the, the immunity will wane over time. And so folks who are not immunocompromised will need a booster dose at some point. And so that's a nuanced difference between a third dose and a booster dose. Um, and so right now, the CDC is given a lot of information regarding vaccinations, boosters, et cetera. Pfizer is the only vaccination right now that is um, allowing a booster to be given or a third dose. Um, and so there, I know there will be a lot of questions about this and I would encourage you to go to the CDC's website or the Ohio Department of Public Health. But in general, um, for Pfizer, if you're 65 and older, if you're over the age of 18 in a long-term care facility, if you're 18 and you have an underlying medical condition, um, if you're over the age of 18 and work in high-risk settings, educational staff, food, agricultural workers, um, there's a list um, that, that continues. You will be eligible for a um, booster or a third dose. And so I wanna encourage you to reach out to your pharmacist like me. I'm happy to answer your questions to see if you qualify. Um, but there are a group of people who got Johnson & Johnson back in April. And I led a lot of those vaccination clinics. And I don't want you to feel like you don't get a third dose, you won't get a booster dose. At that time in April, when we were giving Johnson & Johnson, it was a viable vaccine for the South African variant, and it was the best vaccine at that time. What happens is, as my colleagues on the call have said today, you know, the variants will continue to emerge if we do not continue to vaccinate the community. And so the takeaway today is if you have not been vaccinated, please do so. And then if you're in the situation where you qualify for a booster or a third dose, please get the right information um, and get that dose as well. Thank you so much. I mean, that's just absolutely wonderful uh, information. And I see that you've already answered um, Ms. Potts' uh, question. But, you know, I, I do see another question in the chat. Um, you know, there's still some people who are very skeptical about this vaccination. And so I want to take this time and, you know, maybe... Maybe this is a special a special question for our guest moderator, Dr. Chisholm. You know, we're learning so much, you know, each day about this COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, we're learning so much. It seems like things are changing. One day we say this, the next day we say that. Um, and it makes people wary of the news. So could you start us off by telling us what you know about the role of science and innovation in this pandemic? One of the things that's exciting about even something this frightening is that it has mobilized a scientific movement approach 
on a scale that we have not seen. We have moved so quickly and generated so much new knowledge um, over the past 18 months um, that it feels like drinking from a fire hose. It feels like we don't know what's going on. And part of it is because we're learning as we go. And when you learn as you go in a scientific method, sometimes what we think was right today, we may get more data tomorrow that tells us that's not quite right. Um, and that more data may take us down a different path. It may take us down a different direction. It may change a recommendation. It may modify or um, strengthen or weaken a recommendation. Uh, what's really important for people to understand is that's what's supposed to happen. We're supposed to learn as we go. We're supposed to, as engineers like to say, fail fast. So we want to try something. If it doesn't work, we understand it doesn't work. We push it aside. We move to the next opportunity. And so what we really want people to understand is just because something changed from what you were told last week or last month or last year, it doesn't mean that you were lied to. It doesn't mean that people didn't know what they were talking about. It meant that they were basing that decision last year on the best data they had available to them at that point. And today the best data is different and is leading to a different recommendation. Uh, so what's important is continuing to learn, continuing to listen to the trusted voices who can say, yes, that was then, and this is truth now, um, and who can uh, help you to navigate the overwhelming amount of information that's out there. Thank you. And so as we as we think about, you know, what what is the um, recommendations uh, for today? Uh, should we be wearing plastic face shields? Um, is, is there something else that we as a community can do to protect ourselves? And I'll give that question to um, Dr. Garrison. Um, definitely wear your mask. Um, what I wear on a daily basis um, when I'm working on people is, and it gets very, very hot. <laughs> I wear a face shield. Um, I do have N95 mask, uh, but I normally wear a KN95 mask. It's a little bit easier to breathe out of for me. Um, I wear a surgical cap, a gown, <laughs> and um, glasses on top, safety glasses on top of that. So that's what I wear, you know, when you come in to see me. Um, but out in the public, you should definitely be wearing your mask. Um, for sure in, in all situations, whether it's recommended or not, because you know, not only is it the right thing to do, but you're protecting yourself and you're protecting others. And what I have found with most kids, it seems that if you have a positive attitude about it, your child will in turn have a positive attitude about it. Most kids seem to be fine with wearing masks. I've seen them come into my, my practice and they're like two or three years old and they have their little Mickey Mouse mask on and they look cute and you know, um, they go on about it. So uh, I definitely think mask wearing you know, for the future, face shields help with splatter, but it doesn't necessarily um, as offer the same protection as a mask does. So um, I know when schools reopened like last year, a lot of the teachers were only wearing face shields. And I remember bringing that to the attention of the, my school administrator where my kids went and said, hey, they really need to have on masks. And she's like, well, they, you know, they have on face shields. It does the same thing. No, not really. You know, we use face shields in dentistry because we have actual splatter coming on, but we use face shields before COVID-19. So um, is, does anybody else want to add into that what you me. I would just add, um, just uh, going back to what Dr. Uh, Chisholm said in terms of, you know, how um, our, the data that we have, things may change. And, you know, or, or earlier in the summer, it was kind of like, oh, if you've been vaccinated, you can just throw away your mask. You don't need to wear masks anymore. Well, that was, that was really before the Delta variant really took hold here in the U.S. And we started to understand that with the Delta variant, even if you're vaccinated, you can still get the infection. So before the Delta variant, if you were vaccinated, you were really protected in, you know, in terms of not even getting the breakthrough infections. But now with the Delta variant, you can get a breakthrough infection and you can pass it on to others, which we did not really you know, know from before. So now we, we know that with the Delta variant, you can. So that, that's why the recommendation now is that even if you're vaccinated, indoors, you still wear a mask, you still should wear a mask. So it's not just 
only people indoor settings, you know, should be wearing masks are those unvaccinated. No, it's vaccinated people and unvaccinated people. Everybody should just be wearing a mask indoors in settings when you're around other people that are not within your household. Uh, and even outdoors, if you're in a, outdoors as well as if you're in a place where you're around other people, you don't know their vaccinated vaccination status and you're in close contact with them, you should be wearing your mask as well. And I agree with the modeling, the behavior, you know, so my son who's five and, and, and and an almost two-year-old, you know, he sees, you know, mommy and daddy and grandma always wearing a mask. And he's like, but you're vaccinated. And I go, like, yep, but we're still wearing a mask. So he keeps his mask on. I keep my mask on. We all keep our mask on. And they model that behavior. So um, just to your point, Dr. Garrison, thank you. You know, I think that's wonderful. And 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 certainly uh, I know those plastic face shields make you feel great. You can still see your makeup and wear your lipstick, but, you know, it's better to have those paper masks um, uh, or, or the N95s, whatever you have available to, to really protect yourself and protect others. Um, and so kind of going back to thinking about um, ways in which we can talk to individuals about this vaccine, I want to shoot this question to, to Dr. Nathan. Um, we've heard a lot about the vaccines from you. Can you tell us how they came to be so quickly? And then also, what are the recommendations now for children under 12? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, something that we need to understand, and I think to the point of a lot of the panelists, is that the ability to pivot in this pandemic and kind of, you know, get on board with new information that comes out very quickly, it's very important. But when it comes to the mRNA technology, it is not brand new. So I know this has been stated time and time again, but the mRNA, mRNA technology has been studied for decades. Um, it's not a new modality, it's not new. And so this, um, this technology was not rushed. Um, and really it was facilitated by a lot of different factors. So there were a lot of skilled scientists, we had funding from a lot of sources that allowed the relatively quick production of an incredibly effective vaccination. And it's really, from my perspective, it speaks to the power of what can happen when we work together collectively um, as a unit. And so I want to be completely transparent that when the vaccination you know, surfaced in our communities, I was hesitant. Um, but there was a Black scientist by the name of Kids Micah Corbett, who is a Black scientist with Moderna. Um, and her research in that lab was very powerful. Um, and then there was also a lot of uh, Black individuals that were enrolled in the clinical trials. A lot meaning more than what has been in the past. And so um, when you have about 10% of folks that kind of mirrors how many Black people we have in the community, um, that means that we had a seat at the table. And so it was, I was more inclined to get vaccinated because of those um, details and because of those facts. Um, what I will say is that there have been um, millions of people vaccinated in the United States. Um, and there has been a lot of intense safety monitoring. And so um, from that perspective, even though it was very quick, we are still monitoring how people are responding to the vaccinations, it is not finished. And so we are still monitoring from a day-to-day -day perspective what's happening with the vaccines. Is the information current? We now even have an FDA, full FDA approved vaccination, which is amazing. Um, so we still have two that have the EUA, which is the emergency use authorization, but we've even gotten to the point now where we have a full FDA approval. And so I think that all of those things are important to realize and understand when we talk about the speed at which um, the vaccine came about. Admittingly so, I think Operation Warp Speed was not the best title um, for the development of the COVID-19 vaccines because that kind of implies, you know, a fast track solution. Um, but I assure you that no steps were skipped. Um, it takes a lot of rigorous clinical trials to meet the CDC and FDA's regulations and their benchmarks for safety and efficacy. And so um, to, to have the approval of the FDA is really a step in the right direction um, and something that I would not, you know, hone in on too much of how fast that, that it happened, but really think about the collective effort in our community to get to this point. Thank you so much. That's absolutely wonderful. Now, here is the big question. 
why should the public take the vaccinations if we know that there have been cases of COVID in people who have had the recommended uh, doses of the vaccines? Dr. Wells, um, do you think that we're moving toward requiring vaccination even though it doesn't, it doesn't have an 100% chance of stopping COVID? The, I think yes, if, uh, yes and yes is my, my short answer to kind of both of those comments. And one is no vaccine is 100% effective. Um, we, uh, but we do know that the COVID-19 vaccines that are available are safe and effective in two ways. One, on a personal and individual level, it really helps to prevent severe disease from COVID-19, helps prevent hospitalization due to COVID-19, and also death. And this is very important because really in the beginning, we didn't have this kind of really effective um, prevention strategy from COVID-19. Those who've had breakthrough vac uh, infections due to um, having been vaccinated, they've been mild cases and they, have, and they are not necessarily um, the very sick patients. I think uh, Dr. Nathan said it earlier, we're now in the pandemic of the unvaccinated. We are seeing the cases um, of severe COVID in those patients, primarily those who have not been vaccinated. So it, it's still important to get the COVID-19 vaccine, even though we know it's not 100%. And two, it helps with community risk. We do have our children under 12 who cannot get vaccinated yet. We're hoping very, very soon, maybe in this next month, that it'll be available for those that are five to 11, but they still need to get it. If you've had COVID-19 before, is it important for you to still get the vaccine? Yes, it will help to prevent um, you from having COVID-19, potentially one of the variants that are going around that now you're more susceptible to. And the one thing about vaccines is they have, they're made to have a specific response from your immune system. So they really are targeted to be able to prime your immune system to make sure that you have some protection against the vaccine. Natural infection does not guarantee that as well as the vaccine can do that. And so that's a really important distinction because a lot of people say, if I have COVID, why do I need to do it? I'm, I'm ready, I've got it. But the vaccine is reliable, it, um, reliable in the sense of having that um, that response to protect you from future infection or severe disease, hospitalization, or death. Thank you. Very, very important distinctions, I would say. And uh, one of our uh, listeners has a question specifically about a teenage son, it seems here. And so uh, it looks like uh, this, this teenage son is under the pressure, impression that uh, he can't get COVID again. So, you know, what do you suggest? Do we how do we educate um, our, our young individuals about the risk of getting COVID-19 again? Dr. Um, Joseph, why don't you take a stab at that one? Sure. So, um, you know, what we do understand is that patients that do develop COVID-19, you do develop some immunity to um, to COVID, but it's not necessarily a long lasting immunity. Uh, and so we don't necessarily know how long that would last. And when you when you talk about the vaccines that, um, that Dr. Wells just mentioned, in terms of that the vaccines are kind of more targeting your body to develop an immune response really to the specific protein uh, that COVID-19 uses to get into your body, those spike proteins. I know that everyone has seen what COVID looks like and has all these little spikes on it. Even my son can identify COVID. So those spikes like proteins uh, is what the uh, vaccines help your body to build an immunity to just to those spike proteins there so that when your body sees it the next time, it is ready to attack it so it doesn't really cause havoc in all the organs in your body, which I, like I mentioned to earlier that COVID can get into all those organs of the body, the brain, the lungs, the heart, all of that. So uh, it basically gives your, you know, your immune system a boost to be ready if it's encountered with COVID again. And so, you know, the, the, the teenager that's saying, well, I can't get COVID again. Yes, it's possible. And we have these, you know, new variants coming out, uh, especially the Delta variant, which is more infectious than the previous, you know, COVID. That so it's the Delta variant is even more infectious. So yes, it is possible that you could get it again, even though you've had COVID before and you're unvaccinated. So uh, we would the recommendation is that even if you've had COVID nineteen, that you still get vaccinated. 
Thank you so much. And also just a plug because we didn't, we mentioned about the vaccines are recommended for age now 12 and older. We're hoping that the one comes in for five to 11, but right now the vaccines are, are, are recommended for those 12 and older and pregnant women. So, you know, this was an issue when I, uh, fortunately I'd had the baby before COVID came out, but I was breastfeeding and I was concerned about should I get the vaccine, you know, because I'm breastfeeding. Well, you know, I discussed it with my family and my physician, and we decided I was going to go ahead and get uh, the vaccine because it wasn't, there, there wasn't really a recommendation out at that time, which is, well, you know, the risk benefit, discuss it with your doctor. So now there is a recommendation out. So for pregnant women, those thinking about getting pregnant, uh, want to be pregnant in the future, and those breastfeeding, it is recommended that you get the vaccine because it's safe. So now we have more data now to be able to make that recommendation. So the recommendation is even for pregnant women to get vaccinated because, you know, we've seen now deaths of pregnant women that were unvaccinated that got very severe illness. So pregnant women are at an increased risk of getting severe illness from COVID-19 if you're unvaccinated. So please get vaccinated. Thank you so much. And so one of the things that we've seen in the last um, 20, 21 months is that people have been at home and some of them have been skipping their doctor's appointments. And so Dr. Garrison, uh, I wonder, uh, do you have a message for our listeners about preventive health care in the time of um, COVID? Yes, absolutely. You should absolutely go see your family physician and of course your dentist. Um, you, you want to stay in, in good health. And the main reason is you don't want to end up in the hospital right now at a time where hospitals are overcrowded um, with a lot of COVID patients. Uh, when Governor DeWine shut pretty much everybody down in March of 2020, dentists were shut down. He closed all dental offices on a Tuesday. And by that weekend, by, by Saturday, the dental board had reached out to him and he had sent out a letter to all dentists in the state of Ohio saying, okay, please reopen and see emergency only patients. Because what had happened in four days were those people that had dental infections or toothache or pain, they couldn't get a hold of a dentist because we were all closed. So where did they go? They were all in the ER. <laughs> across the state of Ohio, taking up space, taking up time when people were just trying to deal with emergencies and they're in there for a toothache that could have been handled by a dental office. So that's the other reason is, you know, there's a large population in the state of Ohio nationwide, it, you know, dental care is one of the number one unmet healthcare needs, um, not only in the state of Ohio, but everywhere. So people that don't have insurance or don't have a dentist or, or don't even have a way to get um, any type of care, they go to the ER for things like that. So um, one of our important jobs at that point was keeping patients out of the ER, being able to do extractions and root canals and prescribe antibiotics um, to free up that space. So it is very important to keep up on um, all sorts of, of health care because you, you don't want to be in a position where you have to go to the hospital because of uncontrolled diabetes or, you know, God forbid you have a heart attack or something like that. So being, you know, taking preventative measures can not only help yourself and your family, but also help the healthcare crisis that we're now facing. Thank you. And so I'll plug for, for myself. I, I, I am with Breast Cancer. It's October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so I'll say don't delay your screenings. And so we do have wonderful protocols in place to invite you into our healthcare settings where we're taking temperatures as you walk in the door, masking everyone, hand sanitizer. And so don't delay. And so, you know, we hear you with that, Dr. Garrison. And so certainly we also see that mandates are coming down. And so Dr. Chisholm, can you start us off with talking about um, discussions around the, the, the differences that we're seeing in policies between maybe going into Kroger or um, being out in the park? Yeah, um, yeah, there's a lot of talk about those differences. And reasons that mandates differ or recommendations even differ depend on where you are and who's there and how close you are to them. So the recommendations on what you can do outside and what you can do inside are different. Um, also the recommendations on what you do if you're in a community of high spread versus in a community of low spread are different. And that's why it's important when you're getting information to get that information as local as possible. 
So from your city health department or your county health department who know what the situation is on the ground in the area that you are living or working or engaging. The reality is though, some businesses are going to be very conservative and require lots of protection. Some are opposed to those sorts of protections are gonna be very clear that they don't expect you to be protected there. You have to make your own decisions about your level of comfort in dealing with businesses and you have to respect those businesses policies uh, such as they are to the extent they're consistent with the laws that are in place or the recommendations that are in place. They're going to be different. Just have your mask in your purse and know some places are going to stop you at the door and some may not. Um, and just think about what makes you feel safest. And if what makes you feel safest is wearing a mask every time you walk inside a door, that's just fine regardless of how many people look at you and wonder why you're wearing a mask when you're already vaccinated and inside because you have to care about what's happening in your life, your children's life, your parents' life, other people you're responsible for. Um, read the sign on the door when you walk in and decide what to do about it. Thank you so much. And you know what, our hour has flown by, but I want to give our panelists just one more opportunity to leave you with a nugget. And so let's start with Dr. Wells. What do you want our listeners to know? I want our listeners to know today that um, there were a lot of questions I saw in the chat about how do I protect my child? How, what is the best thing for me to do? And my recommendation is, is that if anyone around you and your family is eligible to receive a vaccine, to go and get vaccinated for COVID-19. Right now, especially for our younger children, that is one of the best ways for us to help protect them um, also from the spread. Um, and I think that it's important to know that this is going to be the most effective way for us to get back to the normalcy that I know we are all desperate to get to. And I think the vaccine is our best and safest option to do so. And so if today wasn't enough to kind of get you over the edge, talk to your healthcare provider, talk to someone who's also had the vaccine, talk about their experience, but talk to somebody you trust because all we want to do is to make sure that everyone can remain safe and healthy throughout. So um, definitely, I hope today was helpful in answering some of those things that you were concerned about. Thank you, Dr. Wells. Dr. Joseph. Thank you. I, I just want to remind everyone, you know, of the importance of human connection. And when our relationships to one another are strong, we can really do extraordinary things. And it just reminds me of the old, pro uh, old African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And if we want to go far, we have to remember that we need to do it together, understanding that your actions affect everyone else. So what I choose or do not choose to do affects you and what you choose or choose not to do affects me. And so the decision of you know not wanting to get vaccinated or not wanting to wear your mask affects everyone in our community. So just remembering that we truly are all in this together in order to really come out of this pandemic we need to use those tools in our toolbox of getting the vaccine, wearing our mask and social distancing when we can. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nathan. Yeah, so to piggyback off of that, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that we are all caught in this inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny and that what affects one directly affects us all indirectly. And really, you know, right now it's not about you. It, it's really not about you. And so, you know, you may not want to wear your mask today, but you have to because we are all connected in this inescapable network of mutuality. And so I encourage everyone on the call to um, take yourself out of the equation and think about how your actions will affect the welfare of your most vulnerable neighbors. Thank you for that. Last but not least, Dr. Garrison. Um, I would like to say definitely wear your mask and get vaccinated, like everybody else has said. Uh, the thing about wearing masks, you will hear a lot of different things. Some people don't think that they're effective, that they don't work, but personally, I have been exposed so many times. I've tested negative every single time because every single time I've had on my mask. Um, back in December two, both of my dental assistants got COVID and I worked with them from Monday to Thursday, right 
next to them. And I thought, oh my goodness. Well, they didn't know until Friday when they couldn't taste or smell. <laughs> I was the only one that didn't have COVID. And so masks do work. They absolutely work. The other thing is uh, my son who uh, he is 17. He actually just had the flu two weeks ago and he, he is vaccinated. And I just thought, oh, he's, he's a breakthrough case. So we went in and he actually has a flu. So there's early cases of flu going around. So definitely get your flu shot. I would also like to say that. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, and Dr. <laughs> Ms. Tarver. Thank you everyone for joining us. This was an amazing, an amazing conversation filled with so many rich gems. Um, in regards to COVID impacting women and our children. Thank you so much to our panelists for taking time out this Sunday afternoon to speak with us. Now we did record this, so we of course will share it on um, the Alpha Sigma Omega platforms that we have on uh, YouTube and Facebook. And we wanna say an extra special thank you to The Ohio State University's College of Nursing. Um, we appreciate the continued partnerships with you. And then to that end, just wanna put the charge out to everyone. If you know someone who hasn't been vaccinated, share this video with them once we post it. Hopefully they'll trust the faces of women who look like them, who are sharing information that's germane to the discussion and to increasing their knowledge about COVID-19. Also, not to, not to say that COVID-19 is the only thing to focus on, but please make sure you join us tomorrow where we will be talking about breast cancer awareness. Um, again, we will have our lovely Dr. Nolan, who will be leading us through that discussion. We thank her for that, as well as partnering with the College of Nursing again. So please make sure you take time out. If you haven't seen the link on our Facebook or our Instagram post, if you want to reach out to any of the lovely ladies who are serving as panelists, um, do that. And with it, I turn it back over to you, Dr. Nolan. And from the Ohio State University side, we want to say thank you because we absolutely do know that the Ohio State is a community. We are in and of the community and we want to be there to serve. And so thank you for giving us a part of your Sunday. We hope this has been helpful and take care.